you got by email, and on the big poster where I made an abstract, I wrote there would be either three lectures or four, depending on audience interest and on whether I succeeded in solving a problem related to the mirror quintic by December 6th, which is today. So the audience interest is the number has started low and has shrunk, so it's not very great. But above all, I decided at 10.30 this morning to give up any hope of solving the problem by 2.30. So I have a partial solution, which I had a month ago. That's why I announced this course of lectures, but don't have a solution. But I haven't told you that problem anyway. So I will, at the end, I'll tell you, uh, you know, how, how it connects up with what we've been doing. But I was unable to present the complete solution I hoped. So what I want to do instead for the first part is a continuation of what I tried to explain last time, which is for general culture. Essentially, every pure mathematician has heard people use the word motives. And most of them get very red in the face and angry. I had a friend who would get furious if he heard anyone use the word motive. He would say, people have been talking about these things for 30 years. They don't even have a definition. They don't even have conjectures. It's just words, words. So a little like I feel about some of mathematical physics. No, no, I didn't say that. So it's, of course, not true. But I want to explain what the underlying idea is also in terms of the concrete exams we saw. I explained something last time. But I want to give you an analogy which is very useful. Consider the notion of a group. Nobody complains that it's not well-defined, that we don't know what it is, that it's not useful. So we know a group is a set with a binary operation closed under multiplication, inversion, and so on. But when groups were first discovered, there was no axiomatic description. Groups were a list of groups. Abel found some groups which happened to be a billion, that's why they're called, by looking at points on an elliptic curve and discovering you could add them. And Galois found that you could do something composing permutations of roots of an equation. They were isolated examples, but a lot of group theory was developed in the 19th century without a definition initially. And the idea was, you know what a group is when you have it. So, for instance, you have an object, like an icosahedron I forgot to bring Fernandez model. You can rotate in a certain number of ways. And those things, if you compose two rotations that preserve the symmetry, it still does. That's not an axiomatic definition. But you say, now we have a group. And so if you wanted an actual definition, you could do it in the 19th century for a finite group. You could say, if I have some finite set and I have uh, some symmetries of it or some permutations which are closed under uh, under product, I call that a group. And we know today that that's a complete and correct definition of finite groups because every finite group can be realized as permutations of a set, for instance, of itself. So every group embeds, you can think of every group as a subset of Sn. So all you have to do is explain about permutations and then say if I have a subset of permutations that's closed under product, I call that a group. But that's a terrible definition because the same group uh, the group A5, of course, it sits in S5, but it also sits in S6, acting on something else, and S20, acting on the 20 vertices of the uh, uh, dodecahedron and so on. It sits in many SNs. We want to think of an abstract group. So the idea, even if you didn't know the axiomatic way, is if you have two subsets of two symmetric uh, groups, but there's a bijection between them which preserves the operation. You say it's the same group. So at least a group now becomes an abstract thing which is sitting in many different places. And even if you don't have an intrinsic axiomatic description, you can work with that and you, do, you actually lose nothing except clarity of thinking. So motive is like that. If you have, as I started to explain last time, a variety, for us, let's say, a smooth projective variety, so I don't want to get into any of the technicalities of mixed motives and so on, a smooth projective variety, so defined over Q. So that means it's given by equations with, which are polynomials. So a lot of variables, a lot of equations. They're homogeneous equations because I'm in projective space, and they have rational coefficients or integer coefficients if I multiply by the denominator. Then, as I explained last time, well, there are several things you can do. So one thing that I talked about last time is there's an L function called the hasse vi or the Hasse Zeta function, Hasse V, not Weil. And I wrote the definition last time, I'll write it again. Zeta X of S is defined if the real part of S is large, 
uh, by the product, uh, sorry, by the exponential of a sum, which is of course the same as the product, the exponentials over all primes and all integers greater than or equal to one, so it's actually p to the n, it's a prime power. And then we take the number of solutions of the equation over the finite field of p to the n elements. Every finite field has p to the n elements for a unique prime p and integer n. And you take the, so you just write down your equation and count the number of solutions where all the coordinates now are not rational numbers or complex numbers, but numbers multiple p. You count it, it's finite, because there are only finitely many variables, each one is p to the n. You take that, you divide by n, and you multiply by p to the minus ns. This converges for s large, and that's the Hasse zeta function. And then, as I explained, we know, these are very, very deep theorems, that if the dimension of x is d, that this thing will factor as the product of L series indexed L0 up to L2D with the even ones, even index ones occurring in the numerator and the odd index ones occurring in the denominator. And each LJ of S, these are now deep theorems that I talked about last time, so I'll just remind you very briefly. Each LJ of S has an Euler product of the form product, so it's equal to the product over all primes, there's you know, over all primes of some polynomial in p to the minus s. Of course, the polynomial depends on x, I won't write it. And p, p of x of uh, t is a polynomial with integer coefficients, which starts with one and it ends with a coefficient, which is again an integer, which we always know, the top coefficient is easy. And it's got a fixed degree, the degree is the same for all primes. Well, some, for a finite number of primes, this question mark might be zero. The degree drops, but for almost all primes, it's the same degree. And bj, that's one of the deep insights going back to André Vé, that bj is the jth Betty number of the variety. So if you take your variety and don't think that as having rational coefficients, but simply complex coefficients, and you look at the complex variety it defines, that is dimension 2D as a real variety, so j indeed goes from 0 to 2d. And then you have the homology groups, uh, like for elliptic curve, the Betty numbers, the dimensions are 1, 2, and 1 for curve of genus g, 1, 2g, and 1. So these Betty numbers are something we know very well. And one of the deep insights is that the geometry of the variety over the complex numbers, but then thought of as a real variety with ordinary homology, that somehow knows about the point counting. This is completely amazing. Now you might say, how do we know that it's the same? Because there's, there could be cancellation. How do I know that, you know, so I could add something. I haven't told you what L2 is and L3. And so I could multiply L2 by something and L3, it would be another representation. And then that would change the degrees. But in fact, another statement, which is known, but that was the Riemann hypothesis of Vey or the Vey conjecture that Delinho got the Fields Medal for, is that if I factor this, as the product of roots nu from 1 up to the Bredouin. So let's call the roots uh, alpha. Well, they depend, of course, on p. So I mean, every, by Gauss, we know that every uh, polynomial factors into roots. Then the, the, the Riemann hypothesis, the Vey conjecture, which is Delinia's theorem, says that all of these roots have the absolute value p to the minus j over 2. Oh, uh, sorry, p, uh, this is j, well, p also, of course and j, so this also had to j somewhere. And it, of course, depends on the variety x. It depends on everything. But here, uh, each of these roots has the same absolute value. So there can be no cancellation because no root. So you, you put the roots where they should be. And then there are also other statements that are completely conjectural. Lj of xs has an analytic continuation. Well, sometimes meromorphy, but let's say analytic. Uh, so in S, for all S and C, not just S very large, where this is provable, that's known for a few cases. But for instance, as I said last time, uh, Wiles's huge discovery that, that in particular included the proof of Fermat's last theorem, the main thing he had to prove is that this was true for this simplest non-trivial case, which is the variety which could have any dimension is dimension 1, so it's a curve. Then the simplest case of the simplest case, that curve is dimension, has genus 1. 
Then it's an elliptic curve. The Betty numbers, as I said, are 1, 2, and 1. So the, already the case of L1, the first non-trivial case of an elliptic curve, is already Wiles's theorem. So then I put exclamation, so it's true, but in general it's totally conjectural, even for L1 of a curve of genus 2. And then if you want to get even wilder, we also conjecture, and that has been checked numerically, for lots of cases that these all satisfy the Riemann hypothesis. But as I explained last time, even in the trivial looking case when the variety is a point, just by, so the point counting, you always get one. This number is always one. Then you compute this immediately for a point. It's just the Riemann zeta function. And as you all know, the Riemann hypothesis is not known even for the original Riemann zeta function. Okay, so that's one point of view. Now, I haven't yet said anything about motives, which is what I was trying to explain. But if the homology of X has some natural piece. So for instance, uh, you might have, uh, for instance, you take the Jacobian of a curve of degree 2. It's an abelian surface. It's H1 is degree 4. But if that Jacobian is isogenous to the product of two elliptic curves, then the cohomology will split into two pieces geometrically. And each of these pieces is natural. They're geometrically defined. So natural, let's say, means it comes from geometry. There are actually three definitions of natural and the huge meta conjectures that they all give the same answer. But for the moment, it's, for instance, the example I said. You're, well, it takes even a stupid example. Let's say my variety is the product of two varieties. Then the homology will split up by Kunnert into pieces and those sub-pieces. So then each one will give, and this you can really do uh, and, and show that it's true, there'll be an L series for each of these. And the whole one will be the product of the pieces, OK? Because the whole homology is the sum of these subpieces, and then the, the L series splits. OK. So, that's, uh, so now, the point is, you do this. You count points on some variety. And you count points on some other variety. And then you find miracle we have the same one. And since that's the main thing I'll do, let me give the key example right now. So example before I go on, so this is the mirror quintic, which was the beginning of the whole field of mirror symmetry. Famous paper of uh, Candelas and uh, his three co-authors uh, that sort of started the ball rolling, well, introduced the idea of mirror symmetry. But I'll be very specific. So we start with a, a family which is called the Dwork quintic pencil. So psi is a variable, but for the moment, think of it as a rational number. And then I have a variable, the, the associated quintic, which is the set. It's going to be of, of threefold. So it's going to sit in P4 over C originally. So it's given by, well, in P4, you have five coordinates. And the uh, equation is that the sum of the fifth powers is psi, this fixed rational number that we've picked, times the product of the xi. And uh, because it's the same five, it's homogeneous, so it makes sense. And this is a Calabial threefold, which is what the string theorists need for what they want to do. But it's a family, because psi varies. So psi could also vary in c. And the statement of mirror symmetry is there's another family called the dual quintic, which I won't write down, in this case, dual family. There are two families. each. One of them, like this one, would have an associated picard fuchs differential equation. As you vary the parameter psi, and you look at the periods, so this is a Calabi L threefold. That means that there exists a unique, up to scalar, holomorphic three-form. And there's a nice cycle. And so you can integrate uh, some cycle here. You can write it down. And you get a number, uh, which depends on, uh, on psi. And you can show here that it's given by a hypergeometric equation. I mean, it, it, well, it's given if psi is uh, large enough. It's if the famous, uh, uh, so this is a multinomial coefficient, 5 n factorial over n factorial to the fifth. And then it's psi divided by 5 to the power minus 5 n, if I remember correctly. So it's a hypergeometric function. But in general, mirror symmetry, you have two families of Calabi-Yells, and one of them it's called the A side and the B side in physics. One of them, you look at the associated picard fuchs differential equation, which tells you how the periods move as a function of the parameter. The periods are like this, integrals of a differential form. But the other side, you look at what's called the Gromov-Witten invariance. You count the number of holomorphic embeddings of rational curves 
or of curves into the thing with given homology classes, and you use those numbers of embeddings uh, to make a new generating function which also satisfies the differential equation. And after some change of variables, it's supposed to be the same differential equation. So it's a long, long story. I'm not going to talk about mirror symmetry. But this was the key example that started at the mirror family is, is known, I mean, the, the two families. But here, I want to show the, so if psi is generic, in fact, if psi is anything except five, then, well, this thing is then non-singular. So it's singular if psi is five. It's non-singular. And I'm interested in the middle homology uh, of, of this thing. But its dimension, the third Betty number, is 204. That means that the polynomial I'm talking about, I'm not going to keep writing the variety, Px, so there are, there are several pieces. But, but the Ps for L3 of Xs will therefore be the product, 1 over some polynomial of P to the minus s. This polynomial. We'll start with one, and it'll end, I think it's, uh, so it'll be t to the power 204. And this is half of, I think, 306, if I remember correctly. Because remember, the, the absolute values of the factors all should be p to the minus 3 halves. So I should get 3 halves of 204, which is 306. So this doesn't look very promising. But actually, it factors. And if I remember it correctly, it factors. So this was done also by Candelis at I'll, I might get this wrong. It doesn't matter at all for what I'm saying. It factors. There are three factors, each of which has degree 4. But one of the, two of them have uh, multiplicity 30. They come many times. And for the dual quintic, it's even nicer. So for the dual quintic, uh, for the dual family, you can also write the corresponding thing. And there, if I write the full L function, uh, then you'll have in the denominator, this would correspond to j equals 0, 2, 4, and 6. So it's in the numerator in the L series, but in the denominator in the Euler factor. They would just be trivial factors corresponding to Riemann zeta functions, except that this one is to the power 1, but this to the power 101, this to the power 101, and this to the power 1. So the total is 204. That's the mirror symmetry. There's a duality. And here, the numerator would only have one factor. R1 of t, whereas for the original one, the numerator would have several factors and the denominator in that case. In the, other, in, the, in the original case, the numerator would be this, and the denominator would be 1 minus t, 1 minus pp to the first, 1 minus p squared to the first, 1 minus. The details don't matter. The point is these are known theorems that the point counting, although the Betty number is huge, it's 204 dimensional, you pick out in particular one piece, which is the interesting one that occurs in both which is the polynomial of degree t, and this r, so I can just call it r psi of t. It has the form 1 minus some integer plus another integer, which if I remember correctly is always divisible by p, uh, minus, I think, p cubed apt plus p to the sixth, uh, t to the fourth. Again, it has to be, this has to be 3 halves times that because the absolute value. So AP and BP are two numbers that you can compute on the computer. They're big tables. And, we, and of course, they all depend on psi. Everything depends on psi. But these are integers. And we also know some bound on their size. So you can make tables of them. And we, do, and we conjecture that this thing also corresponds to a multiple object, but not a usual multiple form, but a Siegel multiple form. But that's a very wild conjecture, because not a single value of psi has been found for many psi's. This has been calculated by several people. Candelis is one, but uh, Fernando Villegas is another, uh, right here. Uh, so we know lots of, of examples, but in no example have, have somebody found a Siegel multiple form that could be calculated and that for small primes gives the same factors. We believe it always exists, but it's very, very hard to co compute explicit Siegel multiple forms of degree two of high level, and so there are no examples. But if psi is five, then this thing becomes singular, and now what happens is that this thing factors. First of all, the degree drops. It's no longer four, it's only three. But it factors as a linear factor, which I can even tell you. It's the same Legendre symbol that we already had early in this series of lectures, 1 minus p over 5 times pt, times a quadratic factor. And when I talked about these things uh, yes, uh, two days ago, I told you that whenever there's a quadratic factor that's part of the general conjectures, it should be the coefficients coming from a multiple form. And here, that's actually a theorem. 
So this is a true fact. Sorry, this one size five. For the singular fiber, the degree drops from four to three because of the so-called vanishing cycle in homology. So the effect of homology is three-dimensional instead of four-dimensional, or rather it's 203-dimensional. But this piece drops its dimension. And this AP, you have a completely explicit modular form. I'll call it F25 of tau, because the important thing about it is that it's a modular form of weight four on the group called gamma zero of 25. But just so that you actually see it, I'll actually write down what the function is, what this modular form is, uh, that I don't remember by heart. It's eight of five tau to the 10th. I won't repeat eight, I've said it many times in these lectures. Anyway, it's the simple product expansion. So eight of five tau to the 10th over eight of tau, eight of 25 tau plus five times eight of tau squared times eight of five tau to the fourth plus uh, times eight of 25 tau squared. So explicitly, this starts q plus q squared plus 7q cubed minus 7q to the fourth and so on. OK, and this is actually a theorem. This was discovered first experimentally by Chad Shun. But as I mentioned last time, it's a theorem due to Delinea that for every uh, modular form that is a Hecke form like this one is, so that means these coefficients are multiplicative. So without even computing, I know that the coefficient of q to the sixth will be 7 because it has to be the coefficient of q squared Q squared times Q cubed, Delinea showed that any modular form with that multiplicative property is geometric. Its L function will show up in the cohomology of a certain variety called the Kugosato variety that you can write down. And so we know that this is geometric. And this one is already geometric. It comes from the cohomology of the quintic. And that means in the fancy language, both of them have associated Galois representations. And you check on the computer that AP agrees for the first 200 primes. And then there's a wonderful, very deep theorem of Faltings that if two Galois representations of the same weight and dimension and so on, if enough coefficients, traces of Frobenius they're called, agree, some fixed finite number that's effective, then they actually agree. And that number was made actually effective, not by Feltings, but by Serre. And other people improved it. And so Chad Shun knew that if he checked this up to P equals 100, that actually proved it was true for all P. And you can check much further. You can check you know, hundreds of values. So this is actually a theorem. So that's like what I said about groups. You don't yet know what a motive is because I haven't really told you. But we know that in this Kugasado variety, where Delinea showed that there's a piece of the cohomology whose L series will be the L series of this cusp form, that's a motive because it's a piece of cohomology. But in this 204-dimensional uh, Betty, a homology group which drops to 203 because we're at the singular point, there's also a, a two-dimensional piece. But that is the same piece in the sense that the L series is the same. And that's what a motive is. So that motive is an intrinsic motive. You can think of it as a piece of the cohomology of the quintic, or you can think of it as the motive associated to multiple form. But it, tomorrow, it may show up in some other variety. It's itself. It's like an abstract group. It can be embedded in lots of different things. And that's what a motive is. It's something that re occurs. So it wouldn't be interesting if the same motive didn't occur in, in different cohomology groups. Then we wouldn't have the notion. But the whole point is even there is actually now a lot of progress. There are now formal definitions. Uh, subclasses like mixed tape motives are completely rigorously defined. Several others, there are two or three competing definitions for what a motive should be, and they're all legitimate definitions. And there are, there are some partial proofs that they agree, but they're not yet known to have all of the properties that we want, the category of motives. And so people haven't yet officially decided that's what a motive is. Because to say it's the right definition, it's a question of, it's a sociological question. Do we decide that's the right one? Only when we can prove the main structural theorems that we want, we say now we know it's the right definition. So it's not that there are no definitions, but the feeling, it's more than a feeling. If you find pieces of two varieties. Now, so you see that this, so here, uh, I was talking about this. So this is at the level of, uh, well, L functions. But then another way is at the level of topology, so the, hom the cohomology groups. But then you don't want just, and that's what you see, but what you actually want is the actual topology or algebraic geometry of these things. In other words, the conjecture, well, first, not a conjecture. Let's say I have some variety x, and I have another variety y, and I have what's called a correspondence between them. So I have some other variety that maps to both of them. Then. If I have a piece of the cohomology here, 
And if I have a piece of the cohomology here, some subspace of H3 of x and some subspace, I can pull them back. And that might be the same piece geometrically. They might coincide. And when I say that it's not just at the topological level, there's also something called Aladic or et al. cohomology. And on that, the Galois group acts and has its eigenvalues to Frobenius. So if you have a piece here and a piece here, and they pull back to the same thing, then since it's the same here, the traces of Frobenius, which are these AP, have to agree. And now we know why that piece agreed. So if you have this geometric map, then automatically, by, by using the theorem, the theory, which is a huge theory, you get the coincidence of the L functions. But the conjecture, so if I make a, a map from uh, motives, I'll, I'll start the same picture, but I'll do it again. We have a map to L functions. But the conjecture is that this is essentially injective. In other words, if you have twice two different things and you find the same L series, they must actually be geometrically the same object, which means you will find such a correspondence. The, the corresponding piece of the cohomology here and here are not just random piece that when you calculate the traces, they give you the same L function, but they really are the same piece. It's not the same variety. So there's a series of maps up and down, but you can always have just one big map. I mean, you could have a lot of little correspondences, you know, up and down, but you can always have one big map. So you can just think there's something which maps to both and explains. And so the, the injectivity is completely not known, but the map is certainly known. So we, if you have the geometric thing, you get L functions. And they have all of these properties, some of which are conjectural, like the analytic continuation and the Riemann hypothesis, but many of them are known. But we have a completely different way which you go on to the complex numbers. That was going to be this thing. So I go to C. This is what's called the period map. And so there, the idea is very easy. So I wrote a long expository article with Konsevich 20 years ago called Periods, where these things are explained with lots of examples. And a period, by definition, is simply the integral over some kind of a cycle in some variety of some differential form. This is an uh, differential form. But on the variety, so it's defined in the differential form, defined over Q or over Q bar. So that makes a countable set, because there are only countably many algebraic numbers and rational functions. Uh, so for instance, well, every algebraic number is a, is a period. But for instance, pi is a period, because you can write pi as the integral. Minus infinity to infinity is a closed path in P1 of R, or P1 of C. And then you take dx over 1 plus x squared. And so that's all it means. A period is simply a number that can be given by an integral. But of course, I have to say with rational coefficients. Because otherwise, if I have a number that we think is not a period, I can obviously write it as you know, if I just integrate the constant function e from 0 to 1, of course, I get e. So I, I need that the integral has rational coefficients. Otherwise, I'd be getting every number. So to get a countable set, these are called periods. And there's a meta conjecture that we actually make there as an actual conjecture, although I usually don't use the word conjecture in a paper unless I'm willing to put on my right hand and you cut it off if it's wrong. I should be really sure. But we do say some words. So I'll say, so conjecture one is preceded by the following sentence. A widely held belief based on the judicious combination of experience, analogy, and wishful thinking is the following. In other words, nobody has any idea if it's true, but it might be true. And that conjecture will say, so this is the, the conjecture I'm about to have, that this map is also essentially injective in the same way. So the statement is this. Uh, you have rules of calculus. So if I have such an, uh, such an integral, then I can transform it another integral. So let me just do it in one variable. Remind you, this is first year undergraduate. The integral of f of x dx from a to b plus the integral from b to c is equal to the integral from a to c. And that generalized to higher dimensions. If you split up the domain of integration into two open, you know, disjoint pieces, then you, it's additive. OK. Secondly, and you'll see they're all trivial. If I integrate from a to b f of x plus g of x dx, or also lambda f of x plus g of x, then of course it's, it's the sum. OK, so it's additive in the integrand, completely trivial. Then if I integrate from g of a to g of b, some function f of y dy, then if I write y as g of x, this will become the integral from a to b, f of g of x, uh, g prime of x dx. So that's called change of variables in first year calculus. And the last integral is that if you integrate a derivative, 
So this is the fundamental theorem of calculus, so the Newton-Leibniz formula. You get f of b minus f of a. All of these generalize to higher dimensions. So if I integrate an n form over an n cycle, then if I add two forms, I add the integrals. If I add two cycles, or which can, uh, not cycles, uh, yeah, cycles, they're chains. So they can, they can have boundaries, they add. This says that you have pulled back, a pullback formula, and this is uh, the Stokes formula, that the integral of a derivative over a manifold is the same as the integral of the original form over the boundary. And the conjecture is that those are the only rules. So the wishful thinking conjecture, written explicitly in our paper, is conjecture one, but as I say, we say we don't really have any idea if it's true, is if, uh, so if two periods are equal, then always for a trivial reason. A trivial, well, that sounds rude, so I'll call it geometric or trivial reason. In other words, if, so you, I gave you one example here for pi. Let me give you a slightly more non-trivial example. Z of three, famous number, is the triple integral zero less than x less than y less than z less than one of dx dy dz. It's very easy to show this, but the point is it's true and therefore shows you explicitly that z of three is a period. There it is. Now let's say that you're very smart and you go home and you think of some completely different maybe a 17-dimensional integral, and you prove it's also z of 3. Or you don't prove it, you calculate it to 100 digits on the computer, you're sure it's z of 3. Then the conjecture says, if that integral is really equal to this, then the reason is you can get from this integral to that one at the level of the integrals, not just of the numbers, by just applying these four rules, just by the rules of calculus. Okay? Now, nobody knows if that's true. There are no counterexamples, obviously, if it's a conjecture, but there are examples connect with the Mahler measure. Fernando is one of the world experts on this, where we have explicit conjectures that two numbers should be equal. Each one is a period, that they're each a Mahler measure or an L series of something, but we don't know, but we believe that we will be able to prove, and many such theorems have been proved. So what that tells you in a fancy language is that the map from a motive to periods, where again we take the homology groups. So here, you represent a homology class by some submanifold, let's say, or some cycle, sigma. And then you have Poincare duality that, uh, no, sorry, not duality, you have just duality. Cohomology acts on homology. And by Durham theorem, Durham's theorem, every cohomology class over C can be re represented by an algebraic form. And integrating that form over cycle is the pairing. And then the, the period is the integral of omega over sigma, but we're now assuming that omega is not rational in the sense of being a rational cohomology class. So this is not a rational number. It's, ra it's rational in the sense of being an algebraic form with rational coefficients. So this number is completely transcendent, like pi, or presumably z of 3. But the idea is that this map should also be injective, that the only way, so this meta-conjecture, that if two periods agree, the actual integrals can be made to, to match up. That says roughly that you aren't losing anything when you go from homology and cohomology to periods. It's written very explicitly in the last section of the paper with Konsevich. So you have two, and by the way, these, uh, this, is, this type of conjecture is called Tate conjecture, and that's a special case. And this type is called Hodge conjecture, that's also a special case. So the meta conjectures say that if you have two motives, meaning you have two things that you found in real life, and you compute, for instance, a period of one of them to 100 decimals, and you compute a period for the other to 100 decimals, and they're equal, then you're sure that there is actually a geometric correspondence between your two varieties. Call them x and y. There is a z which maps to x and y. See here again, if I have a sigma, if I have a sigma here and an omega here and an omega uh, prime here, then I can integrate the pullback of you know, pi star of omega over sigma, and this, uh, forget it, you can push up, push forward and pull back and push forward. If you have maps, an actual correspondence, then of course the integral by the change of variables that are minded can be pulled back to an integral in z, and the conjecture that if two periods are equal, they can be shown to be equal by enough changes of variables means exactly that in some z they simply become identified. So it tells you that you can recognize motives in two completely different ways. All of this is conjectural in general. If you find the same L function twice, as Chad Schoen found for the singular quintic and, the, um, and this particular cups form that he had to find, of course, then you believe that there's a physical correspondence. And if there is a physical correspondence, then the periods will have to agree. And you can check that on the computer. So in this case, since Chad Schoen found this, we know 
that the L functions do agree for this cusp form. So if I take my example, I take the mirror quintic for five and this cusp form, this modular form of weight four and level 25, we know that the L functions agree. Because as I said, you check that for the first 200 uh, primes and then uh, by faulting and, and Sayre, you know that that's enough, it's really true. But then, if the Tate type conjecture, that means that these, these are both actual motives. This anyway, because it's given by an equation, and this by Delinio. So they are pieces of true variety. There's nothing conjectural about them. But we believe it's the same motive, and that we don't know. All we know is that they had the same L function. But if this meta conjecture, generalized Tate conjecture is true that all the experts believe, then it is the same motive. But that means there must be an actual correspondence, something that goes between the Kogasada variety that I didn't really tell you about and this Q5. But if that's true, then every integral on one becomes an integral of the other. And therefore, the periods, here there are also periods, just by integrating uh, this, uh, this one form. That's, this is the period I'm talking about. So I'd be talking, well, it's f and the derivatives of f at five, at psi equals five, the periods should be equal to the periods of the modular form. So a, a modular form has periods. Actually, a Hecke form has two periods, and actually it has four, two periods that have been known for 60 years, and something called quasi-periods that was invented independently in 2015 by Francis Brown in Oxford and by me in connection with something I was doing with Vasily Goloshev in Bonn. But then it turned out that actually it was First, we followed this from the general theory abstractly, but it had been more or less explicitly done by Eichler 40 or 50 years ago and forgotten. But anyway, there's a thing called quasi-periods. So just believe me, if you have a Hecke form, there are four complex numbers associated, two periods and two quasi-periods. And so the conjecture, the prediction, was that since the l functions agree, there should be a geometric map. We don't know that geometric map. But if it exists, then the periods have to co coincide. But here, the periods you can compute on the computer. And also, on the other side, you can compute. What you actually do is you look at this hypergeometric equation. It's fourth, it's the hypergeometric equation has order four. So there are four solutions. This is just one. There are three other independent ones. And you can do those at the original point at psi equals, where I'm expanding, at psi equals infinity, or t equals 0, where t is 5 over psi. Or you can do it at the point psi equals 5, which is called the conifold point, the singular point. And then there's a transition matrix. How, when you have a differential equation, you have four solutions at that point, four here. If you follow a path, the plane is, you know, that point, you just take an interval, let's say. You go from one to the other. Then these four become linear combinations of those four. You get a four by four matrix. That means 16 complex numbers. You can compute them all, and you can make them real by choosing your base as well. 16 real numbers, you can compute to 100 digits. Actually, to, we computed them to 1,000 digits. The first row and the first column are known. So seven of the 16 are known. That leaves nine unknown ones. But then the conjecture, the prediction was that the four periods, the two periods, the two quasi periods, of this specific modular form of weight four and level 25 should show up in that matrix. And with, uh, this is joint work that we've talked about here in ICT bill last year with Albrecht Klemm and Emanuel Scheidecker. And we've checked that uh, to very high precision for the mirror quintic. And actually, the mirror quintic is one of only 14 families that were identified by, no, I think the families were known. But there are 14 families where you have a family of Calabi L3 folds as here, and where the associated Picard Fuchs differential equation is hypergeometric. And Chad Schoen found for the fit, mirror quintic this modular form of weight 4 and level 25. But there should be one for each of the 14 families. I think one or two were known, but Fernando found them all. So we have a list of 14 families of Calabi L3 folds, 14 explicit cusp form, modular forms, all of weight 4, of different levels. The smallest level is 8. Uh, then after a while you have the 25, and the biggest one is 864. And in this joint work, we've succeeded in finding the two periods and the two quasi-periods for all of them. The 864 we only got six weeks ago. It's tremendous computations because you have spaces of, of dimensions, many thousands. It's quite tricky. So in other words, to repeat the philosophy, we have two different ways of recognizing a motive. How do you even know that you think that you have a motive in common? You have two completely different varieties. I gave one example last time. It was Ron Livney's example. Uh, I can remind you what it was. In projective nine space, you have 10 variables. You have the equation sum xi is 0 and the sum xi cubed is 0. So that's a cubic hypersurface in P 
eight, so it's a seven-dimensional variety, and he counted the points, and they correspond to some other form of weight, also four and gamma zero of 10. So when you do that, then you know that the same motive sits in both. You don't see it by looking at the varieties. I mean, you don't see a connection between this and some other multiple form I'll call F10 because it is level 10 instead of level 25. And the only reason you know that you expect them to be the same is you compute the L series. You count something, count points, and you get the same numbers. But then you expect a physical correspondence. So here it should mean that you should be able to find multiple forms Fi of tau of some weight which satisfy this identity, ide uh, the, so the sum of the equations is zero, the sum of the cubes is zero, and, uh, and when you compute the integral in multiple forms, you will find the right integral, but as far as I know in this example, it's never been done. So, but the thing has a very strong predictive power because if the L functions agree, you believe there's a physical correspondence, if there were, then the periods would agree. And the periods you can compute on the computer to 200 digits, and they do agree, and so you're sure that everything is true. Now, if it were the other way, if we could prove that the periods agree, which we can't, but we couldn't prove that the L functions agree, we could make the prediction the other way, because if the periods can be shown to be agree, or even if you can't show, but on the computer they agree to 200 digits, then we're sure that they do agree, then by this we're sure that there is something in common with the motives, then we would have known we should look at the L function and we will see the same L function occurring. Here it didn't happen historically, but if you assume both conjectures, you can go from equality of periods, conjecturally to equality of, or geometric correspondence between the varieties, motives, and then that implies that the L functions agree. So you use the Hodge conjecture to go up and then you go down. Or if you have the L function occurring in two, like here, then the Tate type conjectures tells you the motives should be geometrically related, and then the period should agree, and indeed they do. OK, so that's the end of my uh, mini course on motives. But it's, it's, I, I hope you'll remember some that, so when you hear the words, you say, OK, it may not be a finished theory, but it's not nonsense. It's really saying something, makes very concrete predictions that you can often check numerically and, and in some cases, proof. Now, in particular, however, in this case, as I said, Chad Shun, that's like 1980 or something, I forget, I could look up the date, but it's at least 30 years ago, maybe 40. So it's been known for a long time. I've known this example for ages. All the experts in the field know it. And so the L functions agree, and so we assume that there's a geometric correspondence. And then it was pointed out actually first by Vasily Goloshev, thinking of the usual periods. Since we expect that, you should find the numerical periods of the cusp form, this modern form of weight 25, in that transition matrix, and we found them. And then a couple of months later, I remembered that I'd found these quasi-periods. I didn't know yet that Brown also had them. And I said, well, then the quasi-period should also be there. And we managed to compute them, and there they were. But now that leaves the question, can one in this very concrete example, so I'm now talking about the singular dwarf quintic. So it's the same equation in P4C, but now with five. This particular one should be related to this cusp form we know Morally, we're sure it's related because the L series agree that's proved. It was first numerical, the first 200 coefficients, then because of Felting's and Serre. The whole L series agrees, and the periods agree that's not proved, but it's true to 200 digits, so we're pretty sure that they're really the same numbers. All four of them occurred. So there must be a map, and so the question is, can we make a map? But it's not necessarily a map directly from multiple forms to here, but it means something like a multiple parameterization of this. Just like you do for an elliptic curve, where you, f you have an elliptic curve, y squared is x cubed plus 7x plus 5, and then the Taniyama A conjecture, which is now Wiles's theorem, Wiles et al., says you can actually parameterize by multiple functions or multiple forms that satisfy that equation identically. So you can realize the geometric thing uh, by actual multiple objects, so number theoretical objects. So here we can ask the same. So now this is the idea that I had six weeks ago, how to do that. I'd often discussed with my co-authors, Clem and Scheidegger, whether we could do it in, in, in particular for the mirror quintic example, because it's the most important. It's kind of the central example of these 14. And it looked fairly hopeless. But then what I, so here was my thinking process. And then I thought, now this gives me an attack. I can actually try to construct some other forms that satisfy this equation. See, otherwise you can just wish for them, but how do you go about finding? You can't just look at tables of multiple forms and then pick out five different multiple forms that satisfy something like this. So my idea was this equation has one very striking property, which is that the group S5 acts on it. 
right? You can permute the i's and the sum of the fifth powers and the product doesn't change. And actually there's another group, which is you can multiply each xi by an arbitrary fifth root of unity. So you can take mu5, which is a group of order 5, the fifth root of unity, or multiply arbitrarily, you don't change that. But here on the product, you will change by fifth root of unity, so it's only mu5 to the fifth where the product is equal to 1. So that's a group of order 5 to the fourth, but actually because it's projective, it's up to a common root of unity, that would be the same point. But it's still order 125, and that's 5 factorial. So 120 times 125, uh, who could do that for me? It's 15,000. So here we have a symmetry group of order 15,000. That should help us a lot. So I thought, where could I find a symmetry group? Well, here you have S5. And I knew, like you know, most people know, that S5, well, not quite S5, but A5, is the same as PSL2. Or sorry, SL2. I've talked about this in earlier courses, which is the same as the group SL2Z modulo gamma 5. This is a group of order 60. So I thought, since I'm looking for multiple forms, why don't I look for multiple forms of, on gamma 5? Not just any old multiple forms, but of gamma 5. Five of them, but which are permuted by S5 exactly the way that S5 acts on five things. Okay? And then I can hope that those five will satisfy this equation. So then I, I started looking up these articles that I spoke of last week by uh, John Bayes and uh, Oliver Nash that explained in detail how you construct the icosahedron. Remember, I had lots of pictures and we had a model. Uh, so we constructed it and you could identify the, the, the two sphere in which this sits with P1 of C and then the vertices and the edges and the faces of which there are 12 and 30 and 20 were given by explicit polynomials that I wrote out before. So the first one is x to the 11th y minus or plus, it doesn't, that's a question of convention, x to the sixth, y to the sixth minus, but this sign has to be opposite of that one, that's not convention, and the other two I won't write again. So there were three explicit polynomials, homogeneous polynomials of degree 12, 30, and 20, which if you think of the roots of the polynomials as lines in two space, that's points in P1, then under spheric rapid projection, those are the vertices, the centers of the edges, and the midpoints of the faces of the icosahedron. So, but they also remember to satisfy a wonderful equation, which is that E cubed, which is degree 60, because E, degree, sorry, e squared uh, minus V cubed, I might get a sign wrong, uh, sorry, minus F cubed, so f is degree 20, so f cubed is the same degree 60. And then it was 1728, v to the fifth, where this also is degree 60 because v is degree 12. Right? So we have this wonderful equation, going back to Klein, that says that. But that reminds one very strongly of the fact that I also explained in the second lecture, that if you take ordinary multiple forms, uh, well, now I got a sign wrong, so I, I have to... If, if I'm honest, then I have to do it correctly. So there's, it's, I should have changed the sign of something to make the analogy nicer. If you take the cube of the Eisenstein series that I explained, this is the one that starts 1 plus 240 times the sum n cubed q to the n over 1 minus q to the n. And this is very similar with 1 minus 104 times something similar with 3 replaced by 5. Then you get 1728 times delta of tau. These are multiple forms. E4 is weight 4, so this is weight 12. E6 is weight 6, so this is weight 12. And this is weight 12 all by itself, and you have this identity. So if you compare those two things, you feel that the geometry of the icosahedron is right. And remember, we had the two uh, uh, rhodes ramanujan functions, which I called, I think, G1 and G2. These were multiple fu functions, so weight 0 on gamma 5, so that meant they're invariant under any tau goes to A tau plus B over C tau plus T, where the matrix is congruent to the identity multiple 5. So I won't write down the, the things again, but this was also some theta series that I call theta 10, 1 divided by the Dedekind eta function, and this is the same theta series with 3 instead of 10. So each of these, the theta series of weight half, eta is weight half, you had these, and the action uh, G1 and G2 jointly are jointly acted on by SL2Z. In other words, if you take ABCD in, in the full multiple group 
like minus 1 over tau or tau plus 1, then g1 of tau is not, or g1 of gamma tau is not a multiple of g1 of tau. It's not a modern form on that group. It's only on the subgroup gamma 5. But g1 of gamma tau is a combination of g1 and g2. So together we have SL2z individually with the subgroup gamma 5. And you can write down the, the action of the elements of SL2z on this. But because gamma 5 acts trivially, that action factors through the finite group, which is A5. And so we have an action. When you look at the formulas, you find it's exactly the same action as the action here of PSL2z on x and y. So that means that if you take the polynomial v of either g1 and g2, or it's, it's nicer to work with the holomorphic ones. So if I, let me just call this theta 1 and theta 2, because I'm too lazy to keep writing it. If I take those, my three polynomials for the vertices, the edges, and the faces, and I evaluate them at either the rodis ramanujan functions or the corresponding theta functions. It doesn't matter because there's a common factor eta. All these polynomials are homogeneous. That's just a power of eta. You can forget it. But then if I do this, well, remember v was at degree 12 as a polynomial. The theta is at degree half. So this is a multiform weight 6. This has weight 30 over 2, so it's weight 15. And this one is 20 over 2, so it's weight 10. Well. If you compare this and this, we kind of expect, unfortunately it's reversed, we expect e to correspond to e6 of tau. That is weight 6. 15 minus 6 is 9. So maybe you could have 8 to the end of the 18th. And indeed, when you check that on the computer, that's true. And similarly, v, well, f should correspond to e4 of tau. But this is weight 10. This is weight 4. The difference 10 minus 4 is 6. 8 is weight a half, so it should be 8 to the 12th which is in the ratio of 2 to 3 just as this is. That's good. Everything should be homogeneous. And then this thing has weight 6, and it should be simply 8 of tau to the 12th, and it is. And so if you take these three equations, you find that Klein's equation, the relation between these three invariants of the, of the group F5, E squared minus F cubed to 17, 28, V to the fifth, that's an identity. Remember, these were huge polynomials with gigantic coefficients. They satisfied that identity. But here, when you evaluate them at the relative Ramanujan functions, you get this. So what was my idea how to construct this map? Very simple. We want to realize the group. If, uh, we want to realize the, the group that's actually the icosahedral group, not as SL2 of F5, which I already have by this identification, but as A5. So I want to see the icosahedral group physically as permuting five things. By, all, by only even permutations. And I explained that in the first lecture, there were actually two ways. But one of them, you, of the, of the um, 20 faces, you picked uh, four faces. And I drew a picture on the board. And you take their midpoints. So these are four of the 20 faces. And they're disjoint. And you can do it in several ways. You pick four disjoint triangles of your uh, uh, icosahedron. Okay. And then you take their midpoints, and, the, and it's completely regular. They form a regular tetrahedron. But I've only used four out of 20 faces. So now I take the next face, the, the adjacent one, uh, which is also adjacent to that, but they don't have anything in common. And I find another regular tetrahedron. And I find, in the end, five tetrahedron by dividing up the 20 faces into five disjoint four tuples. So I label, you know, I label each face with one of five colors. And one of the colors is, for instance, red. Then there are exactly f four red things. And their vertices form a regular tetrahedron. But then there are five blue ones, and they form regular. So I get five tetrahedron. And of course, the icosahedral group permutes them. But there are two different ways of doing that. That was what I read in the, in the books. So what I did then is I just took this equation. I la labeled everything. I, count, I worked out which ones form an icosahedron, and I multiplied. So I get a polynomial, p1 of tau, p1 of x and y, which corresponds to the four tetrahedron in one of these things. So I choose out of my 20 roots. So I take this polynomial uh, e, uh, f, which we had for the faces. I factor it on the computer in as algebraic numbers. And then I take the four individual factors that I have, but now I don't see where I, here I wrote it. I write it, and I found that the, um, if I just take those four, so if I take all 20 faces and multiply, I get this huge polynomial that I wrote up before and won't write bef 
again. But now if I just take the four, I get a polynomial degree only 14, uh, only four, and it's this polynomial. So it's x to the fourth minus one, sorry, minus the square root of minus 15. Uh, over 2 x cubed y, then 3 minus the square root of minus 15 again over 2 x squared y squared plus 1 plus the square root of minus 15 over 2 x y cubed and then plus y to the fourth. And of course then there's a second one as any number theorist will see if you have one you have to have the other where the square root of minus 15 goes to its negative, the Galois conjugate. And now indeed if you check that if you multiply j mod 5 and you take the first polynomial, or the second, it's the same, I and mean, you get the same answer. If you multiply, then since this polynomial has four roots, those four roots are the centers of my, of my four vertices of the tetrahedron. But if I multiply by fifth roots of unity, it's the other choices, so I get them all. When I multiply them all, I have to get the face polynomial, and indeed I checked that on the computer. This probably had all been done before, but I didn't know. So this polynomial degree 20 factors over q of square root of minus 15 into five, uh, sorry, it doesn't factor into five polynomials uh, over that field, only one polynomial factors, and then the rest has degree 20, but it factors over the fifth roots of unity as well as square root of minus 15 in this way. And of course, the same is true for P2. So I can also make the polynomial, if I multiply both of them, P1 times P2, so that one now is integer coefficient, so I might as well write it out, although, it doesn't make any difference to anything I say, and you certainly shouldn't care. Uh, so multiple typing uh, uh, transcription errors, that's the polynomial. And now if I multiply this one of degree 8, there are 5, I get 40. Of course, I'll get f squared. So f squared honestly factors into 5 factors over q. f doesn't, but, but f squared does. Sorry, it doesn't factor over q because, again, only one of the factors has rational coefficients. The others you multiply by 50. So this is not zeta j. It's zeta 5 to the power j. I just rotate my icosahedron around one vertex. So now that tells me exactly what to do. Now I take P of the two theta series that I had. Since P, this P has weight 8, this is weight 4. But then it turns out you're still allowed to divide by 8 of tau to the uh, fourth. No, squared, wait a second. P is degree 8, 8 over 2 is 4. I want weight 2, so this should be 2, so I should divide by 8 of tau to the fourth. This function is still holomorphic, and so you, you just do it on the computer, and it's, uh, you get something, and it starts like this. Q plus Q to the seventh, sorry, it actually doesn't, because there are fractional powers, it starts Q to the seven over 30 plus, so, so let's call this f of tau over 30, because it's too much trouble to write all these numbers, then f of tau has integer coefficients, I mean integer exponents, and that one starts q plus q to the 7th uh, plus 7q to the 13th plus 7q to the 19th plus 11q to the 39th and so on. So it's called a power series. So now, if I haven't made any mistakes, then automatically... Sorry, I can't hear. What? No, P is what I wrote, but I unfortunately erased it. P is the product. I had two polynomials I just erased. P1 and P2 had coefficients in, in Q of square root of minus 15. And one is conjugate to the other, but I want rational coefficients, so I multiplied P1 by P2. So this is this polynomial. There is rational coefficients, and it had the property that if I rotate by fifth, uh, you know, by uh, 72 degrees, multiples to 72 degrees, it doesn't matter if you do it for x or y. If you multiply over j from 1 to 5, then this will be the face polynomial squared. Which means that when I insert the rodgers ramanujan functions, if I put theta 1 and theta 2, we already saw that f of theta 1 and theta 2 is e4. So that product will become e4 of, of tau. Okay? So here you get this 
function. So now I'm going to go briefly through the rest because it's already 3.30. I'll just say it would take maybe five minutes to finish. We started, uh, I think, eight minutes late. So this thing ha is, has to be a modular form of weight, too, of course, on something. And uh, OK, that's point one. And point two is it must satisfy that if I define fj of tau to be f of tau plus j over 5. But this thing is periodic because it's a power series in Q. So if I set tau to tau, replace tau by tau plus 1, it doesn't change. So this only depends on j modulo 5. With this definition, and if, if I define f to be this thing, then, and I do this, then it must satisfy uh, my equation. And indeed, it does. So I've solved partly my problem. The problem was to get a geometric correspondence between the mirror quintic for Q5, which is this, and a modular object. Well, I have it. This is the modular object. So I was very happy. That was five weeks ago. But I'm not done, because my modular object here is only a modular curve sitting in here. I mean, the homogeneous thing, since all the FJs have the same weight in projective space, it, it's just a point on the, project, on the modular curve. So it's on the curve x of 5. But that's only a curve. And I cannot realize a third homology group, an H3, in the cohomology of a curve. I need a threefold, or a, even a bigger variety. But Delinea represent, uh, realized the cus form, uh, the L series of a modular form of weight k in a variety of dimension k minus 1. Here it's weight 4. It should be a threefold. Then my correspondence should be more or less a map, like a, bi a rational map. So I want a threefold. And this is only a onefold, but I felt I know exactly in Delinea's theorem, there are things called Jacobi forms, which I'm a co inventor of, so I know them well. And uh, Delinea's theorem tells you if you have a form of weight k, then you should realize that it's called the Kogasada variety. But in terms of modular forms, it means Jacobi forms with one modular variable. I'm not going to define them. And k minus two complex variables. So here we need to lift this modular form by inserting two further variables, which are elliptic variables. So the function will be modular in tau, but will be somehow elliptic in C1 and C2. And I thought it must be very easy. And I already, so in other words, I want functions like this such that if I do the same thing, phi j is phi of tau plus j, but it should again have period 5, then the sum phi j to the fifth should be 5 times the product. But now there are three variables. And then I would have a three-dimensional modular object. called It is called a Kugasata variety. It's fibered over the modular curve x of 5, and the fiber is the square of the elliptic curve over that point. And so if I could find such a modular function with this identity, then I would have my map. Then, of course, I'd still have to check that that period pulls back, but that would just be routine verification. It's got to work. So I'm sure I nearly had it, and I bravely announced this series of lectures. But I've been trying for five weeks. I cannot lift this thing from a modular function to a uh, Jacobi thing. I found a lot of interesting things. I found a function with two variables, tau and another variable, u, which does satisfy the identity. So now I have a two-dimensional variety, which is automorphic. This variety is still modular, but this is not at all an elliptic variable. This is not a Jacobi form, but it's called a Picard modular form, in this case for the group SU of 2, 1, which corresponds to the three ball. But I want to lift to a Picard, if, even if it were Picard, I would need SU of 3, 1, the three ball, to have three variables, and I can't do it. I tried several things, and all of them I could prove fail. So every idea I've had, and I had, to, believe me, I had a whole bunch, and then I found a way to vary this by adding uh, a quasi-modular form to it, and I found two lines through each of my points. So on the quintic, the quintic uh, has the property that certain points on it, there are many, many lines on it. That's true for any cube psi, and they actually form two families on any cube psi. This is a discovery made by Turkish mathematician Mustata, and then improved and made a beautiful version by Candelas, Van Gehmen, Van Straten, and, uh, and Dalla Osa, Candelas' wife. And then I heard a lecture Candelas gave and found an even uh, better presentation relating to the moduli space of five points on the genus zero curve. But there's a nice description that there are two families of lines on this, and each one is indexed. I mean, the base of the family is a curve. This is really hallucinating. A curve of genus, and now I've actually forgotten, as well as, I think, 626. 
but it's, it's very close to that. I, I, I knew it this morning, and I've already forgotten. So you have two different families of lines. And I found lines through this. So I have, a, as, as well as my FJF, I have a line on this that I do have a multiple parameterization by quasi multiple forms. But unfortunately, the lines on this, a family of lines parameterized by surface, is, is too small. It's only two dimensional. And we're on a threefold. So not every point is on the line. You don't get the whole threefold that way. And actually, I realized this morning you're getting a rather boring sub threefold of this. So the final answer is I do not have a geometric map yet that explains the 30 or 40 year old coincidence of the L function of the singular mirror quintic, so the conifold point, and the L function of the Chad Schoen multiple form, or the equally conjectural but verified by us numerically identity of the periods. Each of those separately are known. One is proved, one is proved to high accuracy. Each would be explained completely if you wrote down a geometric map. And then there's nothing to prove once you find it. You just check that it, it's correct and everything follows. And that's the one I hoped to find. And as I said, I have a partial success. Oh, but I, I want to end with one last thing. Because this function, even though, so this function has one nice property I already told you, that the sum of the f of tau plus j, j mod 5 to the fifth, is 5 times the product of the same thing. So that was the connection with the quintic. But the other property is this. Any number theorist in the audience We'll look at this, say, aha, this is a multiple form of weight 2. It starts with Q. It is multiplicative coefficients. Believe me, I checked the first 1,000. And therefore, by the taniyama vey conjecture, which is a theorem, it must be the elliptic curve, the uh, L function associated to the elliptic curve. Now, it's by counting. And so if that's true, there must be a symmetry under tau goes up to sine, under tau goes to minus 1 over n tau for some n. So I looked on the computer for every n you know, until it worked. I knew it had to work. For 900, it worked. So therefore, I knew uh, that this had to be the L series for an elliptic curve of, nine, of uh, level 900. You look in Paris. You can do an elliptic curve search, elliptic search for 900. There are 20 elliptic curves, but only eight that are non isogenous So there are eight L series. I computed them all with Paris. I mean, it, Paris computed them all. One of them was this. And so, and then again, once you know the L series, you know it's true. So E is the following elliptic curve, which I'd never seen before. I have no idea if it's come up anywhere else in mathematics. It has complex multiplication by cube squared of minus three. So it's this curve. Y squared is x cubed plus four fifths. So the concrete theorem, to so just to end with something, take the elliptic curve over cube. Y squared is x cubed plus four fifths. Then you count the number of points. Remember, AP, if P is different from 2 and 3, would be minus the sum x mod P of x cubed plus 4 fifths of the Legendre symbol. So you count the number of points, but you can do it completely in you know, for undergraduate mathematics. It's the sum of Legendre symbols. Then this will be the same as the AP defined by this Fourier expansion. That is provable. And so that is this multiple form. So this elliptic curve, and it shifts by integers, but in this language, you would have to shift by uh, tau plus j over 5, because I, I multiplied that by 30, actually, 6j over 5. Uh, if, if this function and shifts do satisfy the mirror quintic. So at least I have a multidor interpretation of part of the singular mirror quintic, but it's only a one-dimensional thing. I have a two-dimensional thing using these bizarre Picard multidor forms, and I'm still hoping to find a three-dimensional one using Jacobi forms, but it hasn't yet worked. So. I can only report failure on that. OK, so thank you, those of you who are still here, for still being here. Thank you. And we can have, of course, questions. Yeah? It's SU of 2, 1. I wrote it. Un SU, I, I think I wrote it somewhere, maybe I removed it here, SU of 2, 1. But uh, it, uh, the important thing is the symmetric space. The symmetric space is the complex ball. So SU of 1, 1 happens to be the same as SL2. There's, it's one of these accidental isomorphisms. So SL2 uh, acts on the upper half space. Uh, but it also, you can think of the upper half space as the unit disk. Right? But that generalized to the unit ball. So you, the unit 2 ball is two complex numbers, z1 and z2, with absolute value z1 squared plus absolute value z2 squared less than 1. 
Then you forget that's the group that acts on that up to some renaming is called SU of 2, 1. And so that group contains discrete subgroups, which you, it's essentially you take SU2, 1, which are uh, matrices of a certain size, of size 3, that satisfy some identity. But then you take SU of 2, 1, not over C, but over the ring of integers of Z of squared of minus 3. So you have to pick an imaginary quadratic field. Then this group will act on the 2 ball and on the 3 ball if I do SU of 3, 1. And so what I, would, so what I have is a... Picard one. I don't want to write down the definition, but I can actually write down the function because it's cute. Uh, so actually, I should have said anything. One more thing about f. I gave you two definitions of f. One of them was as a polynomial, this complicated polynomial of the two broadest Ramanujan functions divided by power of eta. That's how I found f. But then, after rescaling it with inter-exponents, I said, aha, this has multiple coefficients. It comes from elliptic curve. It's this elliptic curve. But since this elliptic curve is complex multiplication, you can multiply x by q root of unity, it means that this must also be a so-called Grossen character, uh, L-series, which I talked about in my course in CESA this year. And I'll write it down explicitly. You sum over all alpha in the root of, uh, you just adjoin the q root of unity to 1, so that's the roots of the integers of q squared of minus 3. You take all alphas which are congruent to 1 multiplied by 2 squared of minus 3. Every alpha that's primed to 12 by multiplying by root of unity is you can make congruent to 1. And then you have a certain character which depends. You go from the ring of inches modulo 5, which is cyclic. Well, it's cyclic of order 24, surjectively to the uh, sixth roots of unity. And so you write down an explicit character, and then you put alpha, and here you put q to the norm of alpha. So that's, this is kind of standard. That's complex multiplication. So you can do that. But then the, to get the Picard form, and then I'll, I'll really end with that, if I take a new function, f of tau and, z, and to, let's call it x, and here I multiply by, so I still have the q to the norm of alpha. q is still you know, e to the 2 pi tau. But I multiply by a certain function, which is a Weierstrass sigma function. And here it's alpha times x. So the Weierstrass sigma function, sigma of z, is the so-called Weierstrass sigma function of a certain elliptic curve, which uh, here is rational coefficients. I forget exactly. It's maybe 27. It's also called complex multiplication by cube squared of minus 3. But it's a curve I knew extremely well, the function, because in work I did, again, with Fernando, I've mentioned him many times, when we first knew each, met each other many years ago, we did a lot of work on uh, complex multiplication. I talked about it in my course here in CISA this year. Uh, and we found wonderful things relating values of special L functions to something. And so we found that certain L functions had values, and those values had a certain series of numbers. And when I found these numbers now on the computer, it took me a day to recognize them. But then when I did it in the right coordinates, I said, I've seen those numbers before. So the numbers start 1, 1, minus 6. The next one is minus 552. So they're quite characteristic. They're uh, you know, non-trivial enough that if you see them more than once, you're sure it's not a, an accident. The next one is plus 18,600. I mean, I have the first, you know, as many as you want, of course. But these are, they have many, many interpretations. In our paper, we gave several different interpretations, several different expands of different multi and elliptic functions in which these same coefficients, 1, 1, minus 6, minus 52, 18, 600, appeared. And we showed that that sequence of coefficients is quasi-recursive, so there's an elementary way to get those coefficients. But anyway, this is a well-defined function, sigma of z. And to my pleasure, that was, so what I tried here, since I needed higher multiple forms, then if I expand in power series in the other variable, I'll get linear combinations of alpha, uh, you know, poly, uh, combinations of powers of alpha and maybe also alpha bar. So I should get monomials in alpha to the i and alpha bar to the j. If I look at those terms individually, they're so-called quasi multiple forms, but I can look at a whole bunch of them and see if I'm lucky and they satisfy my equation. And I found that the only case that worked was just with polynomials in alpha. And then if I started with alpha, I could put alpha to the seventh times any com number. But then the next one, uh, once I got to alpha to the 13th, all the other coefficients had to be zero. This had to be a specific multiple of lambda squared, which was very hard to recognize until I realized I should put in some factorials. And then it was minus 6. And the next was, was uh, 
550, minus 552. So just completely experimentally, I discovered that if you ask that a power series in alpha x, you just take a power series with unknown coefficients. And now you ask that this new function has the same property that the sum when you shift tau by integers over 5 or to the fifth, that it's 5 times the product, uh, f of tau and x. It's not very likely to happen. But when you do it, you find that you can make it happen if and only if that power series has these first 25 coefficients, which I recognized, and then you can check. But this kind of a function that's a mixture of a usual theta series, q to a quadratic form, and a Weierstrass sigma function, I recognize that from my more recent work that I talked about here two months ago at the special EGAP lecture in honor of Boris Dubrovin. I gave a lecture, and I had Picard multiple forms, and it was the exact same function. It was a slightly different chi, but it was the same q to the n of alpha, but the difference was then there were two functions, just what I wanted now, but it doesn't work here. That was in connection with some nonlinear non systems of differential equations, some integral systems, very complicated. But the function you had to take, there was also a character, but a different one, was of the same form, q to the norm alpha, the same sigma, but here there were two variables, x and y, just what I need here. But here, when I put in the second variable, it does not satisfy the equation. It just doesn't work. So, and anyway, I don't want Picard things, I want Jacobi things because it has to match up with Delenius theorem, which realizes the motive in the world of Jacobi forms. So it's all still a mystery, but at least you see things are happening and that this motivic way of thinking leads you to expect certain miracles to happen. And when you look, miracles do happen. Not as many miracles as I needed, but still I've written about five here, that this thing is the, comes from elliptic curve, that it comes from this, that it generalized to Picard. These are all kind of miraculous things that you would have had no reason to just write them down and think this will happen. But here it somehow had to happen because of this known connection between the group gamma zero of 25 and the quintic. And gamma zero of 25, if you just change tau to five tau, is the same as gamma five essentially. So this is gamma 5. Gamma 5 is the icosahedron. The icosahedron via Rodas Ramanujan gives you multiple forms, and those multiple forms sol solve our problem. So the geometry of the icosahedron solves, except it unfortunately doesn't completely solve it. It only one-third solves. So I'm sorry. Maybe next year I can tell you the rest of the story.